Topic 8.1, Responses to the Environment. To help you study, I've put together a checklist that tells you exactly what you need to study in AP Bio Unit 8, and in fact, all of AP Biology. To download it, go to apbiosuccess.com slash checklist. Unlike the rest of Unit 8, Topic 8.1 is somewhat difficult in terms of providing you with exact guidance about what to study. That's because the objectives are very general, and the College Board has provided these exclusion statements, which tell you that you don't really need to know any specific body of knowledge in order to be able to handle this topic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a couple of fascinating case studies and illustrative examples that'll give you practice at handling the kinds of data sets and images that the College Board or your teacher might be throwing at you on the AP Bio exam or your upcoming test. We're gonna start by looking at predator warnings. Predator warnings, also called alarm signals, are calls or cries emitted by social animals in response to predator danger. These have been extensively studied in the Belding's ground squirrel, which lives in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Belding's ground squirrel has distinct warning calls for aerial predators like hawks and eagles and for terrestrial threats from bobcats, coyotes, and weasels. Here's warning call type one for an aerial predator. And here's warning call type two for a terrestrial predator. Note that these predator warnings are not unique to the Belding's ground squirrel. African vervet monkeys, which are primates like us, have distinct calls for leopards, snakes, and eagles. Predator warnings are altruistic. They're self-sacrificing. They involve individual risk to the self to protect others. When a squirrel emits a call about an aerial predator, it increases the chance that that predator will attack the animal that calls out. That's, of course, true for a terrestrial predator as well. And that leads us to the question, why would an animal risk its own life to protect others? Altruism can be explained by kin selection and inclusive fitness. Let's define both of these terms. Kin selection means that the value of a gene is not based on whether it promotes survival in a single individual, but also in how it affects survival in the individual's relatives. Inclusive fitness means that if an allele promotes sacrificing oneself for the benefit of one's close relatives who also share that allele, then that allele might increase in frequency. The idea of kin selection and inclusive fitness was cleverly captured by the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane, a very important evolutionary thinker of the 1900s, who famously said, I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. What did Haldane mean? Well, here's me. I obviously have 100% of my genes, but my siblings have 50% of my genes. So if I sacrifice myself and thereby allow my brother and sister to continue living and passing on my genes, it's an even trade. So it makes sense to sacrifice myself for two siblings. I have a 12.5% relationship to each of my cousins. And just think about the fact that you have a 25% relationship to your aunt or uncle, so you'd have a 12.5% relationship to their children. Again, it makes sense for me to lay down my life so that eight of my cousins would survive and continue to pass on my genes within our shared gene pool. Your success in AP Biology starts here. Are you struggling with AP Bio? With learn-biology.com, students get the skills and confidence to be a top student and earn fours and fives on the AP Bio exam, guaranteed. Go to learn-biology.com to find out how you can master your biology course and crush the AP Bio exam. With those concepts in mind, Let's take a look at a study by Paul Sherman about predator warnings in Belding's ground squirrels. He carried out the study in the 1970s. To begin with, notice this graph. It shows the mean distance that males and females move from their natal 
borough. That means the borough where they were born. So everybody obviously starts out in the borough where they were born, but then the behavior of males and females is quite different. Females wander very little over the course of their lifespan. These squirrels don't live very long, so even when these squirrels are 26 months old, which is quite old for a squirrel, they're pretty close to the burrow where they were born, less than 50 meters. The males, by contrast, move quite a bit. So by the time they're two years old, they're up to 280 or so meters away from the burrow where they were born. Sherman's key move was to observe these ground squirrels and then to classify who was calling based on two characteristics. The age class, whether they were juveniles, one-year-olds, or adults, and then their sex. I've labeled the age class, but I haven't labeled the sex, male or female. Here's how to read this. The left side of this graph shows the distribution of each of these age classes and sexes in the population. And again, you know the age, you know that these are adults, but you don't know which one's male and you don't know which one's female. And that's true for adults, one-year-olds, and juveniles. The top graph shows the first squirrel to give the alarm call, and the second shows all callers, regardless of precedence. In other words, it might have been the first call, the second call, the third call, and these were calls to a predatory mammal, so to a ground predator. On the right side, it shows what Sherman actually observed in terms of who was giving the call. And what I'd like you to do is to predict which rows are for males and which rows are for females. And I'd like you to inform your prediction by this graph over here and also what you've learned so far about kin selection and inclusive fitness. Make a prediction and then I'll show you what the answer is. Here's what Sherman found. Females were overwhelmingly more likely to emit alarm calls than males were. For example, among adult females, they're about 30% of the population, but adult females emitted over 60% of the first call for a predatory mammal. Males represent about 20% of the population, but they don't even call 5% of the time. So males are way underrepresented in terms of their taking the risk to call, whereas the females are way overrepresented. And that's true of every age class. And that's also true of callers in general, not just the first call, but callers regardless of precedence. So my challenge to you is how would you interpret this? Think about it, and then you can see my answer. Sherman's interpretation is that females are more altruistic than males. But why would that be? Remember that a warning call attracts attention. When females emit a call, they're drawing attention to themselves and warning their close female relatives, their sisters, their daughters, their female cousins. The males don't call because the risk to themselves is not offset by a benefit to their close relatives. So the conclusion is that predator warnings in Belding's ground squirrels are an example of kin selection and inclusive fitness. And what you should take away in addition to this concept is the way that we used claim evidence and reasoning to pull this together, especially how you connect this piece of data to this piece of data to thereby conclude what we did about kin selection and inclusive fitness. Are you asking yourself, how am I going to get a four or a five on the AP bio exam? It's a good question because it's a hard test, but we have a plan for your success. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. The altruism that we just discussed in the Belding's ground squirrel reaches its peak in a type of animal behavior and social organization that's called eusociality. What is eusociality? It's a social structure in which some individuals within a colony breed 
while others are non-reproductive. And just to state the obvious, humans are highly social, but we're not eusocial. Who is eusocial? Bees. In bees, there's a single queen who lays the eggs. She's reproductive. There are thousands of workers that take care of the larvae, they build and clean the nest, they forage, but they don't reproduce themselves. In other words, what they do is they work so that the queen can successfully reproduce. And there are a couple of dozen of males, and the males leave the nest to mate, and then they die. That's eusociality. Eusociality is not just found in the bees, as we just discussed, it's also found in ants and wasps, in termites, in one species of shrimp, and two species of mole rats. That's a type of mammal. And again, what are we saying? We're saying that in a termite mound, there are a couple of reproductive individuals, and everybody else is non-reproductive, working for their benefit. And that's true in a colony of naked mole rats as well. There are individuals who get to reproduce, and everybody else serves them and serves their reproductive interests. Eusociality can be partly explained in animals like bees and ants through the phenomenon of haplodiploidy. And that's a kind of sex determination that we discussed back in Unit 5. I'll review it now and I'll connect it to eusociality. The idea of haplodiploidy is that females are diploid in the same way as you are diploid with two sets of chromosomes. Here we see the chromosomal situation of the diploid queen, and it's very simplified. Bees have 32 chromosomes as their diploid number. I'm showing only six here. The diploid queen creates gametes by meiosis in the same way that humans and mammals do. And as she does, she passes on 50% of her genes to her daughters. The daughters are the non-reproducing females. In males, things are quite different. Males are a haploid. They have only half the chromosomes in every cell of their body that the females do. A haploid male drone, who's reproductive, creates gametes by mitosis not by meiosis. And what that means is that he's passing on 100% of his genes. How do you get to be a male? Males develop from unfertilized eggs that are laid by the queen. And the drones, as I just said, pass on 100% of their genes to their daughters. So how does haplodiploidy connect to you sociality? The sisters are 75% related to each other. What do I mean by that? Well, they inherit 50% of their mother's chromosomes and 100% of their father's chromosomes. So on average, they're 75% related to one another. That means that they're more related to one another to their fellow sisters than they would be to their own offspring. That means that genetically it makes more sense in terms of the inclusion of their genes in the gene pool for workers to help their queen create more sisters than it would be for the females to reproduce themselves because their own daughters would be 50% related to them. So that is a genetic explanation for the altruism of the female workers within a beehive. And just to emphasize something, eusociality can exist without haplodiploidy. Termites are not haplodiploidy, and they are eusocial, and that's true of the naked mole rat as well. And again, this is an important concept. It's important for you to know about as an AP Biology student, but the most important thing for you to be able to do is to look at a diagram like this and use that as the basis for formulating a claim with some evidence and some reasoning about the connection between eusociality and haplodiploidy. 
Topic 8.1 is full of fascinating case studies. We're going to stop presenting them here right now. But what I want to encourage you to do is to go up to learn-biology.com where you can learn about amazing things like why some voles, a small type of rodent, are monogamous while others are promiscuous. You can learn about how ants learn how to make their way back to the nest after finding food in a straight line, not an easy thing for them to do, how turtles can go out to sea, forage there for years, and then how they make their way back to their nest, how and why animals school, and how honeybees with their relatively small brains can communicate to one another through their dances about the location of food sources. It's unbelievable stuff in and of its own right, but the most important thing is that by looking at these case studies, you'll get to be very good at looking at data sets, illustrative examples, visual representations, that will be the kinds of things that you need to do on the AP Bio exam or your upcoming test on Unit 8. Here are your next moves for AP Bio success. Please subscribe to learn-biology.com and please watch this next video.